course, we've all read about the case of the 14-year-old high school boy, Ahmed Muhammad, who was arrested for making a homemade clock and taking it to school and showing it to his engineer teacher, only to end up on the photos, arrested with his hands handcuffed behind his back and taken to police for interrogation. Those are all the things that went wrong with this incident. But I looked at many of the proper and righteous resistance from the Council on Arab and Islamic Relations, who immediately responded in his support and classified it as Islamophobia. And for the Center for Muslims in America, the Constitutional Law Center for Muslims in America, and even from President Obama, who tweeted out that it was a cool device and invited him to the White House, and the mastermind of Facebook, Mr. Zuckerberg, too, invited him to come on out to Silicon Valley, perhaps test some of his electronic genius. And so I go all the way back to Mississippi. Indeed, I go back to uh, slavery, uh, where slaves were the first victims of terrorism in this society. Yet terrorism seems to flow out of the post-2011 awful bombing and killing of innocent persons here in the United States. And so blacks have long been targets of police activity. Indeed, when I went to Mississippi as a civil rights lawyer in 1969, fresh out of law school, I was profiled and targeted and spied on by what is called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. And the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission was like the House on American Activities Committee under Senator Joseph McCarthy that employed law enforcement to spy in an anti-red baiting era. And so did the Mississippi Sovereign Commission spy and target civil rights workers and undesirable people and their opinion. We didn't know about it at the time. We always suspected it, just like we suspected that J.F., uh, the, the, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI spied on us, and it was all confirmed in the church report. And so in Mississippi, they have this sovereignty commission, and they commit some of the same practices that are being committed today in terms of infiltration of peaceful, nonviolent, religious, or civic organizations, in terms of collecting dossiers, often with false information. They didn't have quite the technology in those days, but they still tapped phones, and they still listened in and they still spied and surveilled people by taking off their uniforms and putting on plain clothes and masquerading as participants in these events. But subsequently, the Sovereignty Commission was exposed and it was a great report and uh, there was a debate about whether to release all the information, uh, some of which was defamatory, would expose the privacy of individuals, and to uh, keep it quiet, they compromised by allowing persons to request under a very expedited Freedom of Information System, all of their documents pertaining to them. And my file, I say, is a number of feet high in all of the processing. And so we fast forward to 2011 and the attack on the United States and almost the instant Islamophobia that created... 2001. 2001, thank you, for 9-11. Seems a lot longer ago. Sure it does, but it's still like it's still oppressing yes, it us is. nonetheless. And my personal experience, as Gadir asked me to explain, is that I was in the leadership of the American Civil Liberties Union on its executive committee. And we were fighting against the Patriot Act, and we were fighting against snooping and peeping into uh, records, and we were supporting the uh, Librarians Association that were resisting, revealing a uh, card user's research for information in the library, and we were also adjoining with many of the Arab and Muslim Americans, many uh, persons from Central Asia, Central parts of the Middle East, in fighting against this profile and fighting against this detection. And all of a sudden, out came all of these Muslims and Arabs and Middle Easterners who, like, joined in the civil rights struggle because they became targeted. And it was a wonderful collaboration. It was a wonderful a bit of uh, 
shall we say, solidarity. But some of us African-American veterans in the civil rights movement wondered, quite frankly, where had you been throughout the 1960s and all of the civil rights movement, and where had you been throughout all of the 1970s and the anti-war movement and the urban unrest? But nevertheless, we welcome the joint venture to begin to address oppression. So we believe that oppression against any is oppression against all. We say, like Angela Davis, if they come for you in the morning, they're going to come for the rest of us in the afternoon. And so I come here to talk about this issue in modern day data processing, which I'm sure my colleague Rachel was going to uh, focus on. And I know that Linda has been in the war against them up in, in New York. And we're going to talk about how we can address this modern day surveillance, this modern day targeting. And certainly over the years, I focused on the no-fly cases, which I'll talk about in a moment. So um, in 2011, the Associated Press put out investigative reports about how the NYPD was engaging in unwarranted surveillance of American Muslims in New York City. And that was like news to everybody in New York City, but it was really more of a confirmation for the rest of the Muslim community who already knew that that was happening in mm -hmm. our community. Um, and starting in 2011, I mean, even before 2011, in, in about 2007, we had saw um, a leaked report that came out of the New York Police Department called Radicalization in the West, the Homegrown Threat. And it was a, an, it was an, a report, a 99-page report, that pretty much was some guy in the CIA wrote it out. And what it says is normal things that Muslims do are, are basically red, red flags for terrorism. So, for example, if you're a male and you stop smoking and you stop wearing hip-hop clothing, whatever that is, um, if you start frequenting mosques, uh, things that grow beard, like things that normal people do. Um, and we, uh, a group in New York City came together and said, this looks like it's a prescriptive document to practices against the Muslim community. And the NYPD was like, no, 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 this is just a report. We paid a guy six figures to write it. It's just on our website somewhere. Like, really, we're not using it. So in 2011, when the AP reports came out, it really gave an opportunity for the Muslim community to say, bam, everything we thought was happening was happening. Like, there was no way denying the, what the those documents said. Emily, can you tell us a little bit about the program itself? Many of us are familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a program called the Demographics Unit, a.k.a. the Zone Assessment Unit. And pretty much what this unit was, uh, the job of this unit was to map the Muslim community. So they had dossiers on businesses, restaurants, cafes, bookstores, pretty much mapping the everyday life of Muslims in New York City. 250 mosques, Muslim Student Association, Islamic schools, where South Asian Muslims and where Arab Muslims played soccer and cricket. Like, it got to the details of that. Um, it even had a list that said radical leadership and then dangerous leadership, right? So that literally like imams that we, that are our imams, our mentors, like are on those lists, right? And then, in two, so we started organizing against the New York Police Department. And then in 2013, uh, an Associated Press uh, vid videographer came to my, like showed up at my organization and was like, I need to show you something. I was like, what do you need to show me? So he pulls out a document and that document had my organization's name in it. And that, or, that document basically was part of a series of documents about terrorism enterprise investigations. So there were mosques and centers in New York City that were under this new thing called terrorism enterprise. Just think about that for a second. Terrorism enterprises, right? So my organization is a direct service organization serving immigrants from the Arab world, South Asia, and from Latin America. We provide, we work with women in domestic violence situations. We provide adult education classes. We do after school programs for kids. That's what we do there. So we were part of these documents and what, what it actually said, it went into the specifics. It had a profile, it said confidential informant profile for the Arab American Association of New York. So they had an, a whole resume of what a person that we would put on our board would look like. So between the ages of 40 and 60, country of origin, Syrian, Palestinian, Lebanese, you know, type of profession, medical doctor, business, you know, businessman, like they got into the details. And what they wanted to do was they basically wanted to put a confidential informant on the board of the Arab American Association of New York. So there's a difference between sending me a confidential informant, which there probably could be one in this room today, right. to an event. But there's a di whole other situation when you're trying to get somebody on my board of directors, which is a private entity who will have decision-making uh, power, would have access to files, donor information, everything. 
We don't think that happened because, thank God, my organization is a real Arab organization, and my board member has been around since day one, so they've been there for like 15 years. So this was a document that came out in 2009. So fast forward, organizing in New York City around NYPD surveillance is a very hard job, right? We're not organizing, uh, you know, to build a school in our community, right? You are fighting against the largest law enforcement agency in the country. They would be the seventh largest army in the world if they were an army. And the NYPD, and we know for a fact in this country, law enforcement is relentless. So people in our community are genuinely afraid, and I validate every fear that they have about being public against the, uh, an organization like the NYPD. But just to go a little bit deeper, because I think people who don't live in these communities don't understand the impact of surveillance on these communities. Well, so I just wanted to add one more thing, which is that you know, we're sort of talking about all this information coming in and the way that the government can misuse it and is misusing it. And there's another piece of it, too. You know, I'd sort of said earlier, well, you know, the NSA is a spy agency. It should be foreign-facing, and that's fine. But it's not necessarily fine, right? One of the things that spy agencies should do is, to the extent they're going to spy, spy well. Um, and instead, especially after 9-11, what the agencies were doing, they weren't doing targeted work. They were pulling in all the information possible, right? So they were focusing on a swath, basically, of Middle Eastern countries. They were pulling in huge amounts of information about entirely innocent conversations that people in those countries were having with people here, with people in, in other countries. And they were getting, not surprisingly, totally overwhelmed by it. So even the NSA, which has phenomenal computing capabilities, this is one of the things that came out in, in the revelation from Edward Snowden, is that they, they didn't know what to do with all the information they were getting. They had these programs that were bringing in so much information that it literally overwhelmed their own computing power. They were, they, Department of Homeland Security, other agencies kind of felt under pressure, well, let's get in everything we can because we have to prevent the next 9-11. In the process, they were infringing on American civil liberties. They were essentially infringing on the privacy of a huge number of people abroad and it wasn't helpful, right? It's too much of a mountain of information to do anything. With. It's almost like waterboarding. You know, all the all the evidence, including the Senate report on um, foreign affairs, found that waterboarding was not very the top effective. Chief of NYPD intelligence, Tom Gilotti, in a June 2012 deposition, said, "At least from my knowledge, the demographics unit produced zippo zero, zippo zero leads to terrorism. So imagine that." Map the entire one million Muslims, mosques, categorized leadership, radical leadership, dangerous leadership, um, you know, infil infiltrations, you know, terrorism enterprise investigations. And at the end of the day, there was nothing because there was nothing. And I think that, I think the point I think that everyone's making is that, and I want to make this point and just be clear about it. I have no problem with surveillance. I'm not an anti, like, all types of surveillance. I understand that that is sometimes an effective law enforcement practice. All we're saying is don't spy on people because they're black. Don't spy on people because they're Muslim. You should have some credible information that leads you to spy on any entity, and it shouldn't be based on people's political ideology or people's religious ideology or how religious we are or not religious. Um, and that's the problem. So the problem with these programs is that they are blanket. They're literally like everybody is like caught up. And the thing about the terrorism enterprise investigations particularly, because we, we only know there was like a couple of dozen based on the NYPD um, secret documents, but we, don't, we haven't seen all the secret documents, so we don't know what else is out there. But the idea that if my organization has a terrorism enterprise investigation, that means any person that walks through the doors of my organization is subject to that investigation. So there's a message that has a terrorism enterprise, an open terrorism enterprise investigation. That means every worshiper at that masjid is subject to that investigation. Right. This is what we're talking about here. So this is not just like some like, you know, we're just, you know, there's like, a, you know, some cameras watching us or there's some guy that comes and sits in our masjid and just listens to what we say and leave. The other issue is that they actually keep these records. So if you came, so for example, we were reading documents that said um, that this one informant who was, who was a little older than the rest of the kids, so I don't know how, I mean, I'm sure they knew that he was an informant, but he, uh, in one of the reports, he was like, oh, he went on a whitewater rafting trip with some kids in an NSA. And then he, in the report, he was like, oh yeah, well, what happened was they prayed like four times. I was like, they probably prayed five. <laughs> you, must, you must have been sleeping at that moment. <laughs> 
and the very mundane kind of information, right? But in New York, um, another big case that was huge that really um, shook the Muslim community was uh, the story of a young man named Shaymur Rahman. Yes. Um, and this was a this was a young boy who had gotten arrested for like possession of marijuana or something like that. Cops grabbed him and were like, "Come over here. We're going to act like this never happened. You won't work for us." Promised to pay him. I don't know how much they're going to a thousand dollars a month or whatever. And he did get paid a couple of times. And I think it really it really ate at him to be spying on his own community. And we're talking about like he was hanging out with some of our you know young you know in MSAs and he was like tracking some of our imams and some of our scholars and. One day, he straight up went on Facebook, like straight up. He was like, I'm sorry, I'm an informant, I didn't know why I did this, and whatever. And he outed himself um, in the community um, as an informant. And this was a kid that like came to our stuff, like we know who he is. And he went to listen to Imam Suraj Wahaj speak, and he went to Muslim students, so he went to whitewater rafting trips with the kids. He went to volunteer with organizations like Muslims Giving Back. So this information that these people collect is somewhere and it's one of the parts um, one of the things that we're trying to challenge in New York around changing policy that as part of the negotiations of like you know how long do you keep records for if, if you have 500 pages about me going to get manicures at the local nail salon when is the day that comes that you're like look this girl is not interesting at all like every, yeah and everything she's saying is on Twitter anyway so, um, you, just follow so, so there. Rachel, you wrote uh, it's pretty, it's pretty thick, and it's red, and it says what the government does with America's data. So what should the government do with the data that it collects? And what meaningful limitations should exist for the collection and the usage of the information? Right, right. And it's a good question. It's a hard question to answer, to be honest. So, I mean, we know, sort of stepping away for a minute from the notion of surveillance and of collection for law enforcement purposes, we, we know that there's a huge amount of information that's collected. We live in a bureaucratic state. There are a whole variety of um, kind of bureaucratic structures that are in place for schooling, for employment, for social security numbers, for, you know, recently for health care. And I think that's something that, you know, more or less we buy into as a function of living in a modern welfare state and, and a bureaucratic state. We can certainly quibble with, you know, what's gathered. There are sort of separate issues that we won't get into too much here in terms of how that relates to poverty. And there's certainly um, much more information that is collected and used about people who are in poverty. Um, but so then there are questions about, okay, there's all that information there. Um, how, so you, I think you can set up some protections in terms of how that information is accessible to law enforcement. And to some extent, those protections are there, in part coming out of revelations around the time of the church, church committee. There's a privacy act. Um, there are some limitations, although they are by no means perfect at all, which is one of the things I talk about in the report, about um, what, what purposes information is collected for, how it can be used after that, how it can kind of be shared among sort of different organs of the federal government. So there's that piece. In terms of information that is collected more for law enforcement or national security purposes, I think there are a couple of things. One is, although I don't get at this as much in the report just because it wasn't what I was focusing on, I was sort of taking the collection as a given. But one of the issues, one of the sort of solutions potentially is simply less collection, right? To the extent that part of what we are all saying is that there's really sort of been an overreach historically, but then especially magnified since 9-11. Um, in terms of the collection of information, you know, traveling in and out of the country. Um, at the border, there are, uh, you know, Linda was talking about sort of the national security loophole. There's a big border loophole in terms of the information that can be collected at the border. Um, and, you know, needless to say, um, I think there is a sense and there is evidence that um, that sort of discretion at the border is targeted much more at people of Muslim descent. They really tend to be the targets of, you know, let me you'll find out more about where you've been, about where your family is, about what you've been reading, about what you have on your computer, things like that. So those are really significant issues. Um, there are then issues in terms of just how long is that information kept. It has become simply much easier to keep information for a long time. Um, you know, there are questions about even when information is supposedly gotten rid of, what does that mean? Is it archived somewhere? Is it still available somewhere? You mean delete from the email, it doesn't erase all the email? Right, exactly. Um, and then to whom else is that available? Is it available to the NSA? Is it available to the FBI? DHS is yes. a conglomeration of a lot of different agencies that used to be independent and were put together under one big umbrella. And that gives 
those little sub-entities a lot of authority to share amongst each other. Um, and so I think that's become more and more concerning in that once that information, you know, hops its way from one database to another, it, it's kind of impossible ever to totally erase that trail. Um, and so I think that's where a lot of the, the focus has been in terms of um, limiting the collection, having to be much more individualized based on real suspicion, um, which is not necessarily the case now. The FBI especially has a lot of authority to gather information not on the basis of individualized suspicion, and then really to limit how it can be shared from one agency to the other. Sure. I believe everyone wants security. And people are not against government's practices to protect this nation. But there's such a disproportionate reaction from 9-11 in terms of these practices today. And what I feel is lacking is any honest citizen input. Yes, we may not be the experts on policing and security, but we are the people. The ACLU once had the motto in post 9-11 with the Patriot Act of safe and free. So it wants it to be safe, but there are certain freedoms that should be protected, or at least the government should be required to show why it's not protected. Well, it's kind of what we're doing with the lawsuits. It seems, um, it seems like it's been the only way to work with the New York Police Department. Um, as much as we people will say we got a new, we were we were originally under a um, very military style um, leader leadership of NYPD, which was um, a former Commissioner Ray Kelly. He was from he came from the military. He had a very military mindset. He was kind of like this is what I do. I have no shame in what I do. He was the boss of the mayor. And the mayor kind of gave him free reign um, to mm -hmm. do whatever he wanted to do. And then and then everybody was like, MashaAllah, you all got Bill Bratton, right, from L.A. And what, what New Yorkers wanted to tell the rest of the country was... Under new mayor, de Baggio. Under, under a new progressive mayor, right, what we wanted to tell people is that Bill Bratton, we already had Bill Bratton at one time, and Bill Bratton started right. the, the big mess, and then he went out to L.A., and then Kelly picked up his mess, and then 9-11 happened, and he added to the mess with all the extra counterterrorism. And then um, Bill Bratton came back. Um, the difference between Bill Bratton and Commissioner Kelly is Bill Bratton is one of those guys who will sit with his opposition. He'll sit face to face with you. He has better communication skills. He knows how to have a conversation. But fundamentally, he's very comfortable with the way the NYPD operates. He's very comfortable with the current counterterrorism efforts. He believes that what they're doing is... And he still believes in the broken windows policy. And he still believes in the broken windows policing that disproportionately impacts black and brown people. And there's another name for stop and frisk. So mm -hmm. don't let them lie to you about stop and frisk which still exists in New York, but now they want to call it broken windows policing. Um, I think the way that we're going to we're gonna be able to work with the NYPD on reform is going to be through these lawsuits. I think it's the only way. There's no. There's really been no... Um, no progress in any diplomatic efforts on changing anything in the New York Police Department. For God's sakes, they don't even want to throw out a report that wasn't even written under their administration. It wasn't written under Bill Bryan or Bill de Blasio. And all we're saying is, if you don't agree with this, if you keep saying that wasn't us, right. that is not our name on it. That's some other people that was before us. Well, if it ain't yours, then throw it out. Stand up publicly and say, this document right here, this ain't not ours anymore. They wouldn't, they're not even doing that, right? Um, so the lawsuits are going to be helpful, and it's going to be the continuation of building of this police reform movement in New York City. Um, it's it's remarkable. Um, just the solidarity that's being built, the shutdowns in New York City. New York, um, for people, you know, New York, people think New York is like where it's happening. It's really not where it's happening. There's a lot of traditional organizing. Like, we wake up one morning, and we're like, okay, we're going to go do a press conference in front of, you know, City Hall. Or, <laughs> like, you know, we do, like, some of the, let's, let's you know, get 10,000 petitions to the mayor. It's not what we've seen in other places where people are like, no, we shutting down City mm -hmm. Hall. Like, you ain't leaving this Brooklyn premises, Bridge. right? We're going to shut down the Brooklyn Bridge. That's not something that's really happened in New York at, in the same way that it's happened in other places until most recently. And I think in New York, we're looking for small wins um, to build the morale of the people in New York City. People do think they live in a blue state in New York. And the, we can't even get something simple, sisters and brothers, very simple. Eric Garner was choked on video killed for the whole world to see, right? Right. Everybody saw it. And the man who killed Eric Garner is one man in the police department, one out of 37 police officers. He still got a job at the NYPD. So for me, Gadir, if we can't get one police, one white man f fired from a police department, at, from, and, and this is a call, this is like, 
even people in New York City who don't talk to each other, like we have like, you know, this reverend, don't, I'm not going to name no names, but you right. know what I'm talking about. This reverend over here don't talk to that reverend, and he hasn't talked to him for like 25 years. All of a sudden, they're together, and they're like, Officer Pantaleo got to go. Yeah. So we can get one police officer fired in the police department. I don't really see how we're going to get some like really fundamental reforms in the NYPD. So right now, people are, 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 are small, but I think our lawsuits are going to produce something for us. I think the inspector general already has said that his top five priorities of investigations um, and reports will be about surveillance, which is a big deal. Like, he doesn't have to do that. And working on getting an audit from our comptroller is another kind of avenue. Just kind of, ex it's all about exposing things, right? Because our fellow New Yorkers are like, what are you talking about? Who cares if you get spied on? Hey, as long as you ain't doing nothing wrong, like, y'all should be all right. Like, that's kind of what we get from that's the response that we get in New York City. I think it's our job to keep educating public. I've always felt that social action movement is a reaction to the oppression against them. The greater the oppression, unfortunately, the greater the movement to resist. That was the story of the civil rights era in the last 50 years. That was the story of the anti-war and urban rest era. And now we are combining both the domestic kind of tyranny, particularly in certain police practices, along with this overriding national security issue here in the United States. Amidst the world, in armed conflict, in turmoil, in many places. I think, among other advocacy claims, we should raise these issues to the international human rights level. In the past reporting periods, NGOs did report on a number of practices we're discussing here today at the annual periodic meeting of the UN Human Rights Committee in the various treaty reports, such as the covenant to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination and the covenant on civil and political rights uh, to advocate international norms, international human rights principles to address these local domestic conditions and to publicize these practices on a worldwide level. Rachel. Sure, I don't know if this is a, a prediction exactly, but I guess at least a hope. So in, in my community, so I work a lot on issues related specifically to national security and civil liberties, which ends up connecting a lot to issues of technology. Um, there's a lot of discussion in my community right now about encryption, about the importance of encryption for private communications, um, which is incredibly important. The notion of um, being able to have communications that are, that are actually totally protected. That said, in some ways, that's maybe a temporary response. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen in the last year or two, um, and I think about the investigation of General Petraeus and the fact that sort of through an accident, yes. he was outed um, as having had this affair. His career was basically ended. And the way that that happened showed both the – the power of the FBI, but also just the amazing power of the technologies that we have. And I think what that goes to is that, I don't know if this is a prediction for the future, but I guess a hope for the future, that the technologies themselves are important. Reforms in terms of how these technologies are used are, are important. But really what's important, and I think this just builds on what John and Linda were saying, is reforms to the structures of democracy and the systems of democracy in terms of how the surveillance is used and why it's used. Um, and the connections to mass incarceration, the connections to police surveillance overall, the connections to the drug war, um, and to broken windows, and the ways that petty crimes are used kind of as a hook to try to get bigger fish and to really affect entire communities. Um, and so that's sort of my hope for the future, that we'll see some changes in those structures of democracy overall. Yeah, can, I just, uh, can I offer two suggestions? Um, and I think that our friends, it, the, our friends in the stop and frisk or the anti-stop and frisk, they mm -hmm. took an issue really like a discriminatory police practice and made it a racial justice civil rights issue. We haven't been able to do that in the Muslim community. Our issues are framed in national security. We will never win a national security frame ever. So if we don't frame our issue in a civil rights issue in a civil rights frame, we're never going to win. So that's number one. The second thing I urge you, particularly people in this room, we have the privilege, sisters and brothers. The people in this room. You have privileges that people that we work with in our community don't have. Question everything. I never, ever 
just take whatever the government tells me and just be like, oh, whoa, shoot, that, that, was, too bad. that was a good case right there. They just had it all. I question everything. And we have to question everything. And I'll give you one quick example. When recently, when um, Brother Rahim in Boston, a black Muslim, got shot by the FBI, right? Mm -hmm. They were, they were um, plainclothes officers strolling up to a man at 6.30 in the morning. It was raining outside and dark, right? Approach it. Imagine, just, just put yourself in that position for a second. You're on a bus stop going to work at 6.30 in the morning, and you, some random dudes come up to you, not dressed in any law enforcement, tell you they want to talk to you. You get a little, you probably got a little, you know, like, what are you doing? You get shot dead. Where was the Muslim community on that? We don't question, oh, terror. The minute we heard terror. that there was potential terror, potential terror right. in this case, the minute we heard that the brother was being surveilled by, the, by law enforcement, we went from this. We all, we all just chill. I mean, not all of us did, but 99.9% .9 of us on all sides of the Muslim community, black Muslims to the lightest skinned Muslim, we retreated. We can't be doing that, sisters and brothers, because we feed that, we perpetuate that. And when they know that all they got to do is say, he's been surveilled, terrorism, there's an informant following him, we all sit home, then they're going to say that every single time, and our people are just going to keep going that way. So question everything, and we have to figure out to reframe our cause from national security to civil rights.